Hope everyone is doing well. Hope you had a good weekend. Hope you're ready for a, week, a great new week, a, a week of opportunities to be Christ in your world. You ready? Yes. Well, we are continuing to follow the footsteps of Jesus, and we began at the beginning of Jesus' ministry at the Jordan River. We're continuing to, to look at his footsteps till we were at the grave at Easter Sunday. And what I'm really excited about is the week after Easter Sunday, because the week after Easter Sunday, which you've already heard this morning, is we're going to be having a life group and core group fair. So I'm going to sit down and borrow this chair for a moment. Who knows what a life group is? Raise your hand. Okay. So a life group, if you don't know, is a group, it's a smaller group. And the reason that we're, we do this is not because we're trying to be, you know, just innovative and do things that we think are, we're smart at. We're looking at Jesus. And Jesus had a core, um, well, now I'm getting confusing. He had a bigger, he had a group of 12, okay? He had a group about that size. And that's about the size that we like our life groups, 10 to 15. And what it is, you may be willing to open your, your home and invite a group about that size to where what we discuss on Sunday, then you can follow a discussion guide. Typically, people do it on Sunday night, and they then talk about that. If you can follow a discussion guide, talk with one another, then you're a person that we really would ask to consider this call to, to host a life group. There's something about being in someone's home, isn't there? You know, when you look at Scripture, you see Jesus, you know, speaking to churches that are, that are meeting in homes. And so, you know, what we do here on Sunday has a purpose. And there's a reason that we come together and we're in this large group and we can, and we can worship together. But there's just something that happens when you're in a smaller group in homes. And so if you've been a part of that or if you haven't been a part of that, I really want you to consider either hosting, opening up your home, or opening up your home and, and leading a discussion guide with a small group of people. So we've got sign-ups that we're going to continue to ask you to consider this week and the next week, and then that week after Sunday is when we'll have um, the opportunity to sign up for those groups. The other thing is our core groups. And core groups, again, if we look at Jesus, Jesus had his 12, but then he had this inner circle. And there is something about being in a, in a tight-knit group. A lot of you may not know what a core group is, but a core group is three to four of the same gender going through a workbook where you're studying in the week, and then you come together once a week, and you just you let the, the, the Word be the teacher, Okay? This is what we see Jesus doing, and this is a call that, that I want all of us to, to really consider in the weeks to follow, and I'm praying that the Spirit just is, is calling people to action in that. So, we believe in life groups. We believe in core groups. That's coming up. I want you to hear that from me. I also want to talk about this morning, this guy. This is the Death Hawks Hawk, oh man, Death's Head Hawk Moth Caterpillar. That's hard to say. So we've been looking at caterpillars uh, this month, and uh, sometimes I, I get stuck on something, and caterpillars are amazing. Well, these particular caterpillars have seven diagonal blue lines. A rear, uh, um, at the rear is a curved thorn-like horn. And here's what's amazing about this caterpillar, besides just its beauty, Besides, of, you know, obviously there's design that's in this, this form in the caterpillar. But what I didn't know about this caterpillar is that when it goes to the next phase, before it turns into its little cocoon in the pupa stage, it actually goes underground. Eight to ten inches underground in a cavity den is about the size of a hen's egg. It will form its pupa to transform into a butterfly. Isn't it amazing when you see things in, in, in creation that you know is the fingerprint of God? All right, let, let's just let's ask God for Him to be in our time. Father, we just ask now, um, the Creator of all things, 
the creator of every, every individual who is here this morning, of every creature, of every plant. Father, I pray that you be with us now as we look and continue to look at the footsteps of Jesus. And we pray this all in your son's name today. Amen. So today, what we're going to look at is two encounters that take place in Jericho. So we have been, like I said at the beginning, we've been following the footsteps of Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. And where we are today is he is about to make this final trip to Jerusalem where he would be crucified, where he'd be buried, and he'd be raised again. And there's two incidents in Jericho that we're going to look at. Um, just some interesting um, uh, details. It is nearly a 4,000-foot difference in elevation from Jericho to Jerusalem. J so Jesus is about to take an 18-mile journey uphill from Jericho to Jerusalem. And this is the first encounter that we see. This is in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. It says this, he entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. How many of you are familiar with the story of Zacchaeus? He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and, and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so what I want to do is in this first encounter where Jesus is coming into Jericho and the crowds are following him, I just want to point out several details about this encounter. So the first one is, is that Zacchaeus was rich. Okay, It says that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and was rich. So if you know about the time and what um, tax collectors did, he's basically a political thief. He, he is receiving his money because of his connection to the government. Aren't you so glad that that doesn't happen any longer? There was a cost associated with that. Um, the cost of Zacchaeus manipulating and taking from people, even though it was legitimate because of his government ties with, with Rome, he now became the fringe. He was no longer accepted by his own people because of his enrichment. But he was an outcast, but he was still rich though, right? I mean, why is he seeking Jesus, Jesus if he is rich? Well, uh, this is not news to you, I know, but there are many things that riches cannot buy, you know? Um, it's fascinating to me. Do you know that there are people who overlay food with gold? <laughs> I mean, it, it, you can get a gold-encrusted steak, gold-encrusted this. Do you know what it does to the experience, the flavor? Nothing. It doesn't change the flavor at all. But you know what? If you're rich and you can cover food in gold and eat it, I, okay, I guess. Um, I heard a story about a recent red carpet event where the people received gift bags. <laughs> and these gift bags, um, I think they were worth like 170 something thousand dollars in their gift bags. 
There's a lot that money cannot buy. And even though Zacchaeus was rich, I would argue that he was actually quite poor. Let's continue to talk about Zacchaeus. He was a seeker. He was a seeker. Why was he a seeker? He was a rich man. What did he need to seek Jesus for? Um, you know, one thing I noticed about the story that I hadn't really, hadn't really dawned on me, but Zacchaeus, he's, he's seeking Jesus, right? There's a big crowd. He can't see him. And I don't know why this never stood out to me, but he runs ahead. Like, he's strategic. He sees where the crowd is going, and so he runs ahead. So not only is Zacchaeus someone who's willing to climb a tree, but he's also running ahead. I wonder if Jesus saw that. I wonder if Jesus saw Zacchaeus running on ahead, climbing the tree, but he was a seeker. And even though people may not have understood why he was seeking Jesus, I can identify with that. Sometimes people don't see what you know. Like some people may think of you, well, hey, you've got money or you've got more money, you've got a family, you've got this, and they can create a list, and they don't really see your need. You may be here this morning and people say, you look nice, everything looks great, but you're actually in great need that people can't even see. And that is Zacchaeus. He is a seeker of Jesus in need, even though maybe others couldn't see that great need that he had. He is a seeker who can't see. <laughs> right? That's why he climbed up the tree. He's a seeker who can't see. The problem was he was small in stature. He was a rich, I would argue a poor seeker who cannot see and he had a desire. What desire does a rich man have in seeking Jesus? Well, like I said before, treasures fail. Treasures fail. Zacchaeus had a great soul need. Someone who was a part of a people, but now on the fringe of society because of the choices that he made, he had a desire that, that could not be bought with money. And what's interesting too about this story with Zacchaeus is that there's this parallel seeking because Jesus is seeking Jesus as well. It was Jesus who called Zacchaeus from the tree, come down, hurry, I'm going to your house. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And Zacchaeus was willing to trade his riches for a need that Jesus could only meet. The sole need that he had. And Zacchaeus was also a person of faith. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. He didn't feel like a son of Abraham from his own people because he was an outcast. And he was a son of Abraham in that he was a part of the Jewish nation, yes, but also he was a man of faith. He was willing to give everything that he had to repay fourfold. Galatians 3, 7 says, Know then that is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And so here we have Jesus encountering Zacchaeus. I want you to just kind of notice these details about Zacchaeus. And then Jesus leaves Jericho. Our next encounter is in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 46. And so in verse 46, it says, And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. So, 
let's look at some details of the second encounter. In, on the way out of Jericho, Jesus meets Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus was poor. He was poor, poor. Right? I would argue that Zacchaeus was poor in a way that maybe the world didn't see and recognize. But Bartimaeus was poor, poor. He was poor and blind. He was a blind beggar. So, Bartimaeus was also on the fringe of society, right? He was begging people for money. He was seeking money, but he was also seeking money, or he was also seeking something that money could not buy. He was seeking something else. He was a seeker. He says, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And then he's rebuked. So, in the story of Zacchaeus, Jesus was rebuked for seeking the company of Zacchaeus. Here in this story, Bartimaeus is rebuked for seeking the company of Jesus. But they're both seeking. And Bartimaeus is seeking vision. He has a flesh need. He was a seeker who could not see. He wasn't short. He was blind. And so in both of these encounters, Zacchaeus could not see. Bartimaeus could not see. But he didn't let that rebuke stop him. He shouted out more for Jesus. He had a desire, a flesh need, a vision. He said, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? Let me recover my sight. And he also had faith. Jesus himself says this. He says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Jesus gives authority of his healing faith. So, I know I've kind of scanned over these, these two encounters kind of quickly, but as I was studying these two passages this week, there are many things that kind of just stood out to me. And I, I just this is a real moment this morning. If you're asleep, you can wake up for a moment. Sometimes it's hard. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to... Um, have a desire to, to, what is it, God, that you want me to share? This was one of those weeks for me. And as I was studying these two passages, these two encounters of Jesus as he's going to the cross, there's so many things. There's, we could talk about faith, we could talk about healing, we could talk about seeking, blindness, repentance, forgiveness, all that's there. But the thing that really stood out to me as I looked at both of these stories was the similarities that they shared of two very, very different people. <laughs> Zacchaeus, this man who's rich, he's the chief tax collector. He's living a very different life from a blind beggar. But yet they had so much in common. And as I was thinking about that, it, it, it just rings true to me of how much in life we allow to divide us. There's so much that we allow to divide us, but yet we are so similar. We're on the same journey and we share so much in common. And we live in a world where we see sides. We like to see sides of things that divide us and we could look at their stories. We could see how they're divided. Poor, rich, blind, seen, upper class, lower class. And we, it's easy to pick sides that will divide us without seeing the spirit of division that is behind them. I call it a satanic strategy of division. And we see this all the way back to the garden where you see Satan who's trying to divide mankind from God, Adam from Eve, humankind from the garden, we see him begin to start to divide. Remember, God comes and, and, and Adam is saying, well, it's this woman, and, and here they are, they're pointing fingers, they're picking sides, and they're becoming divided. In Ephesians 6, it says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. 
that our battle is against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, the spiritual forces of evil. But we're living in a world where there's a lot of division. We live in a world where we are divided by race. And I wonder if you can see this satanic strategy of division, of picking sides. You know, I don't know how long, the last decade or so, there are all sorts of topics. Systematic racism, white privilege, safe spaces that are actually segregation, equity, not equality, social justice, not justice. And man, I know that those words immediately come within many of us like a side that we side with. Can we see and recognize the spirit of division that is unseen? I mean, I'll tell you what, billions have been spent on making these topics visible to see. That create in us the, the, an argumentative spirit, a, an advocate of this side or this side, without noticing that there is a spirit of division behind it. We are divided by class. I did a search, divided by class, and I started looking at some of the articles. And the articles, these are the top engine, uh, search engine results, article swaying to this side or this side. We're divided by religion. I wonder if we can see a satanic strategy of division, even within Christianity. Remember all those talks that Jesus gave on denominations? Because I don't. <laughs> Do you know within Christianity, there are over 40,000 denominations? There are so many things that we can see and pick sides that divide where we're looking at, the, we're looking at, at what divides us, sides, and we're not seeing what's underneath it. Just like that snake in the tree. We're divided by political affiliation. Did you know that? <laughs> I am not here to advocate for a side today. But I hope I can uncover a satanic strategy of division. It's this uh, look here, not there, slight of demonic. <laughs> where it's this side and that side. And I don't think that all sides are equal and we don't need to have any wisdom. I'm not saying that, but here's what I do know. Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus share a witness that if we're just focused on sides that divide, we don't see that common, that the similarities that we all share. There is a spirit of division in this world. What if we were to stop being advocates for sides of issues and be advocates of people? We see this in Jesus' life. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus is, is coming to his hometown and he has been casting out demons. He has, a, he has a deliverance ministry of healing people with demonic spirits. And as he's coming to his own town, you see the spirit of division in his own family. As his family gets wind of this, and in Mark chapter 3, of, uh, 21, his own family saying that Jesus is out of his mind. We see the scribes, the, the religious, who then are trying to divide religiously. And in verse 22, the scribes say, it is by the prince of demons that he cast out demons. Dividing, dividing people. And then Jesus, in his own defense, but then I think also teaching us a great lesson, he says this in Mark 3, verses 24 and 25. He says, A kingdom, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And here's what Satan loves to do. He loves to come in and just place a wedge of division. How many of you who are married or in a relationship have seen 
this take place where just this little, the smallest thing, a wedge of division. Um, <clears throat> have you ever seen them take down a tree? <laughs> Brad, what are you talking about trees now? Have you ever seen when they take down a tree, they'll put a wedge in it. And it just slowly increases and increases that division where it can bring down a massive, massive tree. And in a marriage relationship, it can be, um, Brad, you cooked that pasta, it was too salty. <laughs> that did happen. It could have been a wedge. I don't really remember how that ended. But the smallest things, the smallest things, now we're, we're picking sides and Satan has put this small little wedge of division in that if, if, it's, if, if, if it's not dealt with, if, if there still remains unforgiveness in our heart, you know what Satan will do? He'll come by and just tap it a little bit. And this can happen in your marriage. This can happen in a friendship. This can happen in, in church. This can happen anywhere because this is the, the tactic of Satan. is to come put a wedge in that's undealt with that slowly be, becomes greater and greater and before you know it, that tree is on the ground. The spirit of division. We see it in Jesus' life, but Jesus has such a different approach to mankind than division. In John 13, 34 and 35, he says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And what's important, let's go back to that other passage. What, what, we, what I see here in this passage, again, something that stands out is what Jesus says, this is a new commandment to love as I have loved you. Jesus didn't allow a wedge to, to, to create division. You know how many times in Scripture Jesus has encounters with people that could have been a wedge to divide Him? The way in which Jesus' love was completely different. He didn't allow wedges to come in to create division, but He became a bridge for division at the cost of His life. When Jesus prays in John 17, verses 20-23, through He says, I do not ask for these only, not just those that were with Him present at that time, but also for those who will believe in Me through their Word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me. And love them even as you loved me. So Jesus prays that we would be one. Satan seeks to divide us. And I really believe that the footsteps of Jesus teach us that there are, there's so much that can divide us. And when we allow that to take place, we forget the power of a unified witness of the things that we all have in common. The things that the similarities that we share, just like Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus. In, in life groups tonight, the discussion will ha have us thinking about how we can share the similarities. How we are all poor. We are all poor. We have all experienced um, the type of poverty and spirit that I think Zacchaeus had, the type of poverty and spirit that I think Bartimaeus had. We have all experienced a, a, a desire for something that, that money can't buy when we come to the Lord in faith. We have all been on a search. We have all been seeking for to what could what could fulfill that poverty that we experience inside? And some of us has, have searched through that through, through identity. Some of us have searched through that through, um, through lust. Some of us have searched through that through you name it. We've all been seeking. We've all been on a path that didn't pan out. We've all been at a place where we can't see how we can fulfill our own selves. 
We've all experienced the desire that the world did not fulfill. And we all experience the power of being a child of God through faith, just like Zacchaeus and just like Bartimaeus. And one of the reasons why this is hard, a lesson for me today, is because I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to lay out like a 12-step plan here this morning on how to fix all this. I'm just convicted that we need to see our similarities of what we all share in common when we come to the Lord. And so I'm hoping that you can do that tonight if you're part of a life group. I'm hoping that... You know, one thing that took place, and I've mentioned this to many people, but one of the things that took place during the pandemic was that there was this, I like to call it a spirit, that this, this spirit of... of isolation that people kind of experienced and everything was watching online and everything was like you know isolated by yourself i wonder if there are any effects that have lasted outlasted covid what do you think anybody (laughs) i really do and in a church maybe we don't see the wedge that satan would like to divide us quite the way that we do in a marriage relationship or anything else but Satan wants to attack the church. Satan wants to put a wedge that, that's so small, so insignificant for us as we come together and share life with each other that he can just slowly over time just continue to knock and create a greater and greater divide or division. And this is, no, this is not a sermon that's all leading up to this big push of this church program of life groups and core groups, but guess what? I know that Satan would love to divide us. He would love for us to come here on Sunday mornings and see each other every week, but yet there are things in our lives that are not shared. There's things that we experience in life that we're, we're, we're actually growing farther and farther apart. And so I want to pray. I want to ask that the Spirit uses these programs So over the next several weeks, I I wanted to get some testimony of some people who've already started a core group. And so um, I want you to hear from two who are in a core group today, and you're going to hear some more throughout the next weeks. But um, let's go ahead and play those videos. Hi, this is Frank Wolf. I belong to a core group. Do you? If you don't, you should. You're missing out. Good people, good study make more friends join a core group today i think the thing that really sticks with me really helps me the most is building those intimate relationships with with a couple of people while building that intimate relationship with god it's it's really given me a support system like doing doing what god has asked us to do is hard it's sacrificial it's supposed to be, but it's really <laughs> extremely hard to get started, especially when you don't have anyone you can talk to. And you can have people that understand your faith and still don't really understand what's going on and what you're doing and what you're trying to do. But having this small group of people who know you and know how difficult certain things are for you, who are there to hold you to it and make sure you do it, and who are there to be excited with you when you accomplish it is it it truly is remarkable it's amazing and you don't have to have all the answers none of us have all the answers god even tells us that we don't have to be afraid of not knowing what to say because he'll tell us what to say in that moment all you got to do is take those first steps and having my little group has really made a difference in my confidence and my ability to to trust that so i really got, hope you guys join one and and get to understand that and get to to know that feeling too you know jesus he walked this life not alone he didn't walk this life alone he was sharing meals on the seashore he was uh having experiences in a boat um with a smaller group. And 
Jesus prays that we would be one. And I'm asking, I'm asking you to really consider what the Lord might be placing on your heart to become part of a life group, to become a member in a core group because there's nothing that Satan would love more to put a wedge that divides and continues to separate the church, the body of Christ here on this earth. So as Richard, you come, a, come on a, up here and we'll, we'll close in worship. Um, if you will, please stand with me. And uh, I'm going to pray a similar prayer that Jesus prayed. If you want to respond, the invitation is yours in any way that you feel called. Father, we just want to ask right now for... the Lord, lead us in ways that we don't even know how we need to be led. Lord, it's hard when we don't have all the answers. It's hard when you don't exactly see the path forward. But Father, I know this. I know that there has been an attack on the church. There's been an attack in this world, Father, that is, that is dividing people, that is separating people, where sides are so seen, yet what's unseen is the Spirit that would love us to be divided. Father, I pray that we can become advocates of people and not advocates of sides. Father, I pray that we can become more one. I pray for each of our families that our families can become more one. Father, that we will recognize in our families the wedges that Satan has placed to divide us. And Father, instead of us allowing that wedge to just continue to stay there and create more and more division over time, Father, I pray that we will, we will cast that out. Father, that we will have the spirit of forgiveness. Father, I pray for our church to be more one. Father, if uh, life groups and core groups is not the way, Father, may it fail spectacularly. <laughs> but Father, I know that You desire for Your church, your, the body of Christ, to be one. And so, Father, lead us how we can be more one. Help the unity of our witness reveal to this world that they may know that they may know You, they may know Your Son, and they may know that You loved them. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray this morning. Amen. Let's stand and sing.